Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our service tonight. Um, if you are visitor with us, please be, you are particularly welcome. Um, we're going to spend some time after the service, um, have some tea and some coffee and some biscuits. Please do stay around um, and, and chat with us. Um, we'd love to get to know you. Um, I'm so thankful for Amelia and Miranda who have shown us tonight that we don't smell. So thank you very much. You've sat nice and close. Um, no one sat nice and like last week. Um, as we start our service tonight, um, I just want to read from Ephesians um, 2. Yeah, 2, but it says 2, 4, just verse uh, 4 and 5. My phone would play. Oh, it's not. It says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Please stand and we'll pray just as we start our service tonight. God, we thank you that you first loved us, that we are able to meet together only because of what you accomplished on the cross. And God, as we worship your name tonight, God, we pray that you are glorified in all that we do as we listen, as we sing, as we just spend time together in fellowship as one family. God, let your name be raised above every other name. Amen.
Let's pray together. God, how beautiful you are, how majestic is your name, God. And yet you chose in all your glory and all your goodness to create us. You continue to love us even although you know every single thing about us. There's nothing that we can hide. And yet you still love. God, we could never imagine what it cost to die on that cross, to pay the penalty for our sin. And you did it, God, because you love us, but also for your glory. God, we pray that as we sing your praise tonight, that we never stop being amazed by how good, how perfect, and how beautiful you are. When trials come in life, when things don't go as planned, you never stop being good. You never stop being beautiful. God, we pray that that, that never leaves us, that when we are struggling, that we don't turn to other things, that we don't try and put our strength um, in things that we can see or rely on ourselves, but God, we continue to rely on you, knowing that in every circumstance, you are good. And the bad and the excellent, you are good. God, we pray for those who are not able to join us this evening. We pray for, for Paul and for other people who are struggling with sickness. God, we know that you're a good God and a God who can heal. And God, we pray that you heal these people, whether it be through miraculous means or whether it be through the medical teams that are treating them. God, we pray that your hand is at work and that as you do, whatever you do, that God, your name continues to be glorified. In this difficult time through sickness, that your name is still glorified. God, we pray that as we, as we gather this evening, that our ears are open to hear what you have to say, that we are ready to be challenged about the sin in our life, that we're ready to be challenged in the ways that we're not following you, and that as we meditate on that throughout this week, that God, our lives are changed, that our lives are transformed, but that that is only possible because you first loved us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a couple more songs before David comes up. Um, and we're going to start by singing, I Believe in Jesus. Um, as we do that, can I please ask the stewards to lift the offering? So we'll stay seated. Um, and then once the offering is, is taken up, then I'll ask you to stand. Um, if you're a visitor with us this evening, please feel under no obligation to put anything in the bag. Anything that you do put in will be gratefully received. Um, but please feel free to just allow the bag to pass you by. Of God. I believe 
ليس بسيط Good to see you all in church tonight. Before we begin, uh, two intimations. Um, one that I forgot to um, announce this morning was that small group is on tomorrow night. So if you're involved in small group, eight o'clock at the manse. Um, and it's the next chapter of the book um, from the one we were looking at last time. Chapter nine? I think it's chapter nine. Second intimation, um, maybe one that I didn't emphasize enough, was that if anyone is available on Friday at 1 p.m., uh, to come to the church and to help with the installation of the poppies, then please speak to Nancy and let her know that you're coming, and I'm sure she'd be very grateful for uh, the help. Let's turn to the Word of God together and return to our study in Paul's letter to the Galatians. This is our third week in this autobiographical section where Paul refutes the claims of false teachers who have come to the Galatian church and carried out a character assassination on the apostle as they've sought to discredit him and the gospel that he has built the church upon. We've already heard him explain to the Galatians in the latter half of chapter 1 of how his term as an apostle has been so much longer than his attackers, the Judaizers, have been telling people. We've heard him describe in the first section of chapter 2 of the theological agreement between Paul and the Jerusalem apostles on the subject of salvation, that it is faith in Christ alone that is necessary to have our sins forgiven, with no requirement to adhere to the ongoing statutes of the Jewish law an agreement that quashes the Judaizers' suggestions that the gospel Paul preaches is inferior to that of Peter and the others, or has been contorted to the point where it needs their correction. As we finished last time, we saw the same Jerusalem apostles offer Paul and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, recognizing Paul's commission to take the good news to the Gentiles. But it's clear that Paul's detractors have been sharing at least one particular incident that they believe shows a lack of unity and a lack of agreement between Paul and his Jerusalem counterparts. And the apostle, with nothing to hide and content to disclose, content, sorry, to disclose fully the events of all his dealings with his brothers in the capital, addresses this episode in the verses that we will read this evening. So if you have a Bible with you, please turn with me to Galatians chapter 2. It's a short reading this evening, just four verses but we know that the Lord can and often does speak powerfully to us in these small chunks in the letters of His servant Paul. Galatians 2 then, reading from verse 11 to 14, this is the Word of God. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Amen. And may God add his blessing to this reading from his precious word. And let's just ask God's help before we look at these verses in a little more detail. Heavenly Father, as we are gathered, gathered with your word open, we open our ears and our minds and our hearts to what you have to share with us this evening by the power of your Holy Spirit. Equip us with your truth and shape our attitudes and approaches to our ministries and relationships through its teaching, we ask. Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our paths, Lord. Keep us faithful to it, we ask. In Jesus' precious name, amen. He made free use of Christian vocabulary. He talked about the blessing of the Almighty and the Christian confessions which would become the pillars of his new government. He assumed the earnestness of a man weighed down by historic responsibility. He handed out pious stories to the press, especially to the church papers. He showed his tattered Bible and declared that he drew strength for his great work from it, as scores of devout people welcomed him as a man sent from God. Indeed, Adolf Hitler was a master of outward religious dedication, but as his actions showed, as he led one of the most brutal regimes in modern history, there was no inward reality to his claims. 
Now, politics is not the only place that we find hypocrisy, although it never ceases to amaze me how disrespectfully MPs will refer to one another in the chamber at Westminster and then refer to them as the right honorable lady or gentleman. But it's something that we see everywhere. The word hypocrite comes from the Greek word for actor, someone who would don a mask and would appear outwardly to be something different to what they were in reality. And to that end, it's an easy concept for us to grasp and to spot when an individual says one thing with words, presenting their intentions, their concerns, their passions, and their character, only to behave in a way that demonstrates that what they have said is true of them is either wishful thinking or downright falsehood. And hypocrisy is a charge that is often leveled at Christians. I don't know about you, but I've heard many people on many occasions decry the Christian faith on account of the alleged hypocrites who fill our churches. In defense of Christianity, the moral and ethical standard that we profess is that of Jesus, and that is literally impossible for us to live up to on earth. But that doesn't mean that believers are exempt from this charge. And we must be aware and be careful to make sure that how we act does, where possible, corroborate what we believe and what we proclaim. This evening, we find ourselves in a passage where this exact issue has raised its ugly head, and not among the rank and file of the church, not among those who were adapting to massive shifts in behavior, having recently converted from Judaism or paganism to the Christian faith. This was a disagreement among church leaders, and not any church leaders, but apostles, men set apart for bringing the good news to others, men set apart for, uh, for, to evangelize the world, and men set apart to build the church. Christian unity is a crucial feature of the church, and perhaps it's for this reason that discord and dispute within the fellowship are always painful and uncomfortable to watch. But we cannot sacrifice truth for the sake of unity, and we are called to identify error and rebuke and correct our brothers and sisters in accordance with Scripture in a spirit of love and concern. And contrary to what the Judaizers may have been spreading among those they seek to distance from Paul and his gospel message, this is what we read about this evening. Because although some commentators are reluctant to engage with this conflict in a way that the text demands, some going as far to say that this was some other guy called Peter that Paul was in argument with, simply because they don't want to suggest that everything between these two giants of church history wasn't always rosy, what we have here in Galatians 2 is an example of Christian accountability that comes from a concern about a brother's conduct, the implications for his ministry, and ultimately for the spread of the gospel itself. Paul doesn't say what he says in order to accuse or to discredit Peter, but to challenge him in his hypocrisy, to encourage him to be a better apostle and to be a better Christian. And it's important also for the Galatians to see the specifics of this exchange, not simply because it tells the real story of an incident that the Judaizers were using to their advantage, but because it confirms Paul's identity and authority as an apostle and that he can hold Peter to account when he steps out of line. Paul says here in verse 11, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. In 2011, Ruth and I attended the wedding of one of our friends from university. As has been the case for most of the weddings I've ever been invited to, we were at the table near the back, the one that's a little bit further away from all the others, specifically prepared for people with this kind of relationship to the happy couple. Exactly half of this table were made up of other friends of Ruth's from uh, her time at university, and not wanting to be on the periphery, Ruth pulled a fast one, and she switched her place name with mine, which moved her one seat closer to her chums in the center of the conversation and left me on the outside edge. And so for what seemed like the whole afternoon, I would turn to my right and see the back of Ruth's head as she was engaged in a conversation about Aberdeen Uni, and I would turn to the left, past the empty chair that was immediately next to me, and see the back of some stranger's head as he engaged in his own conversation with his own group of old friends. Now, before you start to feel too sorry for me, Scotland were playing that day, and the isolation meant that no one noticed or told me off when I regularly checked for goal updates on my phone, so that particular cloud did have a silver lining. But that incident made me really aware of the dynamics of the table from that day forward, of how poor preparation or someone pulling a fast one uh, can lead to dinner guests feeling isolated or excluded from the company and the conversation. I'd never considered anything like it before, and I think it's because in our 21st century Western culture, there is far less importance attached to our protocols around the dinner table. For back in the first century, in Paul's day, 
the table was a far more important uh, place to be, particularly within the Jewish community. Mealtimes were sacred to Jews because keeping the dietary and food laws of Judaism was one method by which an individual would exhibit that they belonged to God. Table fellowship would always be considered to include fellowship with God, and sharing food with the people around one's table would show that those same people shared in the blessing that the head of the house had spoken over the meal at its outset. But then came Jesus. Then came the Lord, whose own ministry was so often carried out around the meal table, and whose actions and teaching often rankled with legalistic Jews, obsessed with keeping the rules on how food is prepared, how it is eaten, and crucially, who it was shared with. They were appalled by Jesus' lack of distinction in terms of who He would and wouldn't eat with. Jesus' inclusion policy around the meal table, of course, reflected the entirety of His mission to free humankind from the penalties of their sin by suffering our punishment himself on a Roman cross. It extended beyond devout and virtuous Jews, and it was available for all who would put their faith in him as Savior and Lord, just as he remains available to all who call on him today with the same offer of everlasting life in heaven with him. Fast forward a few years to our passage this evening when we find ourselves in Antioch, a cosmopolitan melting pot of half a million people, 10% of whom are Jews, and a growing number of others are Christians. And it is in Antioch that an issue around table fellowship first emerges for the Christian church. As we established last week, the Jerusalem apostles and Paul agreed that there was to be no requirement for Gentile Christians to be bound by the law for salvation or in any other capacity for their day-to-day living. However, for Christians of a Jewish background, there was no demand for them to withdraw from the ceremonial law, in spite of acknowledging that it was their faith in Christ that had saved them and not their commitment to the customs and practices of their heritage. And there's nothing inherently wrong in this approach. There's nothing wrong with applying an extra level of spiritual discipline in how we live our lives. I met a lovely couple at a wedding this summer who refused to eat black pudding on account of the words of Leviticus 17, verse 14. You must not eat the blood of any creature because the life of every creature is in its blood. Anyone who eats it must be cut off. They knew that their salvation didn't depend on avoiding black pudding. They knew that they would not be condemned by eating it, but they both felt that it was a sacrifice they wanted to make on account of this revelation of it being the seat of life in that verse. There's nothing wrong with abstaining from certain foods or drinks or from particular practices as an act of worship to God, but we must always remember that these make no contribution to our salvation. And so long as we remember Romans chapter 14 and don't attempt to enslave others with the devotions that we have prayerfully adopted for ourselves. For the Jewish Christians of Antioch, their keeping of the ceremonial law extended, however, to the people that they could eat with, because to have table fellowship with a Gentile was a break of that law which meant that whenever the church came together to eat, then those of Gentile origin would not be invited to dine with those who had been evangelized and converted from the synagogue. And so, in spite of their being brothers and sisters in Christ, the believers in the Antioch church were divided when it came to this issue of table fellowship. When the European football championships were held in England in 1996, The Dutch national team famously imploded, and stories of infighting and arguments among the players and staff emerged. And towards the end of all of that, towards the end of the tournament, there came out this photograph, and it showed the players sitting at two tables waiting on their dinner. One table had all the black players at it, and the other table all the white players. It's an iconic photograph, and I'm gutted that I couldn't find a version that was big enough to put on the screen uh, on the internet, but if you Google it, you can find it. Now, whether this was an issue of racism, as it clearly looked to be, or whether it was an issue of who had ordered what for their supper, as was the official explanation, we'll probably never know for sure. But this image reflected what the Antioch church must have looked like whenever they had a soup and sweet. The Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians all sitting on different tables. Now, as we learn at the outset of this passage, Peter demonstrated excellent leadership qualities in this situation. It tells us that he used to eat with the Gentiles. Rather than contribute to this issue, the apostle crossed the divide and would share a table with those of a Greek background. This practice following on from accepting Titus, as we saw last week, reaffirms Peter's commitment to the equality of Christian brothers and sisters, irrespective of their backgrounds. And if we turn back to Acts chapter 10, then we can see why Peter, of all people, 
was prepared to act in such an inclusive manner because he had been the recipient of a vision from God where three times a sheet appeared to descend from heaven full of all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. As verse 12 of that chapter tells us, basically it was full of animals that Jews are prohibited from eating. God then encourages Peter to get up to kill and to eat and makes that game-changing statement in verse 14 where he says, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. It's a word from God that convinces Peter that the Gentiles are not only to be the recipients of the good news alongside Jews, but also that they are to be the recipients of table fellowship alongside Jews. And so, we would expect to see nothing else when we see Peter arrive in Antioch from Jerusalem than to see him sit down amongst the uncircumcised believers to break bread. But something happens, and it changes everything. And all of a sudden, the apostles' radical solution to the separate dining areas dissolves. And it dissolves through fear, and specifically through fear of man. Reading from verse 12, it says, For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles, because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. This group of men arrives from Jerusalem, and as they come in the front door, it seems that Peter's courage, his theological convictions, and his desire to treat God's children equally and impartially leaves and passes them on the doorstep, because no longer does he sit at the Gentiles' table with the men and women who have Greek names and Roman names. Instead, he pulls back. The word used here to describe his withdrawal is the same Greek word used to describe a military retreat. What power these men have over him? Where does it come from? Well, it's not immediately apparent. Admittedly, for a group of once orthodox, pharisaical Jews, men who still practice the same dietary laws as they did when their outward devotion was a key part of their ministry, seeing Peter, a pillar of the church, eating alongside Gentiles wouldn't be any more shocking for them if they were eating bacon sandwiches. But why should Peter care? Why should he change his behavior? Why should he stop backing up what he believes with the actions that confirm his conviction? The most depressing thing about it all is that these men whose good books Peter seems to want to remain in, these guys whose opinion of him or of his reputation matters to Peter so much, they aren't even apostles. In the grand scheme of God's plan for the church, Peter outranks them, and yet their personalities are clearly strong enough to overrule even a revelation from God himself. And we read in verse 9 that James, the man from whom these men have come, was a part of the discussion with Paul concerning salvation theology on his second visit to Jerusalem. We also read that he recognized Paul's commission to the Gentiles, and we read that he offered Paul the right hand of fellowship as well. So these men who arrived in Antioch after Peter are even disciples of a man who shares a theological viewpoint as Peter himself. And yet, Peter crumbles. His fear of Christians who used to be Jews is enough for the outworking of his doctrinal principles to collapse. Worse still, his withdrawal is infectious, as we read in verse 13. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy even Barnabas was led astray. And so we see that just as his willingness to dine with Gentile believers built bridges between two groups of Christians, Peter's retreat from them built barriers instead, as his example was followed by all of those who shared a previous religious experience. This level of cowardice from Peter is quite remarkable, especially considering the anguish and the heartache that followed the last example of it recorded in Scripture when Peter disowned the Lord following his arrest. But isn't there an arresting message for all of us in what we see here? that no matter who your Christian leaders are, they are not Jesus. And the truth is that no matter how powerfully and boldly those leaders may speak in a pulpit or at a communion table or at a midweek event or at a prayer meeting or a small group, no matter the enthusiasm with which they preach and pronounce the gospel as truth, we must never stop praying that the Lord will bless our leaders with courage. Because over a lifetime of Christian witness, there will be many occasions in which that courage will stumble and stutter, and even occasions where it will fail completely. We must be dedicated in prayer for the courage 
of our leaders, that they will faithfully defend and proclaim that gospel against all opposition, whether that comes from the, in the form of hostility from the world or heresy from the church. We must ask the Lord that He will give them the backbone to stand their ground for the truth that we profess, that Christ died for sinners, and that faith in Him is the only way to heaven, as His sacrifice is the only thing that could pay the price of our rebellion against God, to have us welcomed back into the relationship with the Lord that we were created to enjoy. Because it takes courage to stand up for the gospel in some circumstances. I'm sure we can all think of a situation where we would be terrified and intimidated, a scenario where we would want to hide away in a corner and hope that nobody would notice we were even there, let alone be asked our most fundamental beliefs. But we cannot allow ourselves to be governed by that fear. We must overcome it. And the way that we do that is to keep building our relationship with Christ, a relationship that is built on His perfect love, which, as John tells us in his first letter, is the antidote to fear. And if we do that, then we will preach the Word, and we will be prepared in season and out of season to correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and with careful instruction, as Paul encourages Timothy in his second letter to him. Well, we haven't said a great deal about Paul so far this evening, have we? But the apostle to the Gentiles steps back into center stage now that the details of Peter's pretense has been established. Reading in verse 14, he says, When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? You know, I don't think any of us would have thought Paul's exasperation was unjustified if it was expressed in response to how Barnabas, his friend and co-worker among the Gentiles, had been led astray. I don't think any of us would bat an eyelid if the reason for Paul's anger here was that Peter, by his behavior, had shown that the agreement that had been revealed back in verse 2 was a lie. But what really enrages Paul here is that the gospel itself is at stake, and Peter is leading others away from it. And so when we read in verse 11 at the beginning of this passage, we find Peter described as condemned. It's not a verdict that Paul throws at him from his own book of ethical standards. It is that Peter stands under sentence from God on account of this hypocrisy that denies the good news. Now, normally when we think of hypocrisy, it's demonstrated by someone who inwardly believes one thing and outwardly pretends to be something better, something more noble, something more truthful, something more charitable, or something more inclusive. What boggles the mind about Peter here is that his hidden belief is what is correct. And it is his hidden conviction that is in alignment with the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is his hidden doctrine that is found in the Orthodox Christian gospel. What he shows outwardly, what he doesn't really believe to be true, is the heresy. And it's the same lie that the Judaizers brought to Antioch, and it's the same lie that they bring to Galatia as well. How many times have we heard it now? That the gospel with anything taken out is not the gospel. And the gospel with anything added to it is not the gospel. Well, in succumbing to the peer pressure that James's companions bring with them, in feigning agreement with their prejudice and their selfish piety, it is Peter himself who is adding to the good news. Because although he agreed with Paul last week that it is faith in Jesus Christ alone that will bring sinners into fellowship with God, Peter is adding further conditions before sinners can come into fellowship with him. For an apostle of all people charged with the building of the church to distort the gospel in this way cannot go unchallenged, nor can it be resolved in private with a quiet word in Peter's ear once the church lunch is over. In accordance with what the Holy Spirit would inspire Paul to write to Timothy in his first letter to his apprentice in chapter 5 and verse 20, but those elders who are sinning you are to reprove before everyone so that the others may take warning. Paul calls Peter out, and he condemns how his actions in forcing the Gentile Christians to adopt the customs that are no longer necessary for dealing with sin, simply so that they can sit at the same table and enjoy the same meal with their brothers and sisters, is enslaving them to rule and regulation instead of freeing them to enjoy a relationship with Jesus Christ, liberated from the power and the grip of sin as they should be enjoying. 
Peter's hypocritical actions speak louder than his truthful words. And people notice. Both Jew and Gentile believer notice, and the impact on his fellow Christians is noticeable, and if it's permitted to carry on, it could be devastating for the church. And as a consequence, that is worthy of anger. That is worthy of rage. And contrary to the unjustified fury of Jonah this morning, this from Paul is a righteous wrath. But what would he say to us? What do our actions say to those around us? How do our friendships and our social calendars and our dinner guests, what do these say about the unity and the community that we have in Christ? Are our actions out of step with the gospel as presented here by Paul? Or are we committed to demonstrating what we believe, what we have committed our lives to through our actions and through our deeds? As the reformer Martin Luther remarks in his commentary on Galatians, this passage should be a source of comfort for us as we try to do just that. Because we will not manage it flawlessly. We will stumble and we will falter just as Peter has. And the fact that Peter, of all people, has taken his eyes off Jesus Christ and the gospel of the cross and the empty tomb means that there are none of us who are exempt from the same weakness. None of us who are exempt from the same hypocrisy. But being in good company alone is not what encourages us. It's the return to the message that in our hypocrisy we have turned our eyes away from. It is the return to the gospel, which reminds us that it is not our conduct and our piety that justify us, but it is our faith in Jesus Christ whose death on the cross covers all of our sin, the sin that we have committed before we knew Him and the sin that we will commit before we see Him. And so, although this passage reminds us that everyone can fall, it also reminds us in the truth that is defended and protected by Paul's objection that we can all get back up again. Peter was blessed to have a brother in Paul who loved him and who loved Christ and who loved Christ's church enough to challenge him. And it's always a good thing to have brothers and sisters who will hold us to account for our good and for the good of our witness and our ministry. Friends who we can have accountability with are worth their weight in gold. And if you have some, thank God for them. And if you don't have any, find some. You need people who will ask the difficult questions, who will force you to look inwardly, who will force you to examine your heart, who will force you to face the things that you are doing which are making you hypocritical not people who will revel in our failure, but people who will help us back to our feet when we backslide. Friends like these are so important to have. Friends who will direct us back to the friend of sinners who cancels our debt and who sets us free. Let's resolve to shun hypocrisy. Let's keep our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith, walking the walk that he would have us tread, and that matches the talk that he would have us talk. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word and for this passage from it. We thank you for this window into apostolic accountability and for this demonstration of the fallibility of every single one of your children. Or we see so easily ourselves in Peter's error of how fear can derail our witness and our testimony so easily. And Lord, we ask your forgiveness for the times when we have withdrawn from opportunities to proclaim your goodness and faithfulness for that very reason. Lord, we ask that you will plant in our hearts this evening the forgiveness that we have and the sacrifice of Jesus and the faith in him that you have led us to and the boldness to overcome our anxiety in taking a stand for you. Lord, we ask these things that we may be more useful to your kingdom, in your kingdom work, and we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
We're going to finish um, our service tonight by singing two songs. Um, the first is You Are My Strength When I Am Weak. And then the next one is All My Ways Are Known To You. And both these songs really looking at that in all circumstances we can rely on God um, because ultimately God knows what's going on. God's in control. He has everything of our lives sorted. We just have to trust him even when that's hard. Um, so please stand with me and we'll sing You're My Strength When I Am Weak.
says in Ephesians 3, 20 to 21, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. 